Hello and welcome to Talk Back, the show where we ask tough, compelling questions from tough, compelling people. When he was benched after his first cricket test ever, the newspaper said Imran can't, but he didn't. But still, today, things are a little different for him. The Times of India says that he's a good-looking yet unwise idiot. The popular Urdu Jung of Pakistan says that he's a great man, but a bad politician. The very respected Herald questions whether he's the third force of the third force. And those neocons at the Weekly Standard say that he's an Islamist politician by day, yet a London playboy by night. But to millions of Pakistanis, he's none other than the greatest cricketing hero this country's ever seen. His name is Imran Khan, and he is my guest here tonight on this episode of Talk Back. Keep it right here for a very hard-hitting show. I'm Vijayat Saeed Khan. Welcome to Talk Back, the show where we ask tough, compelling questions from tough, compelling people. Imran Khan, welcome back to Talk Back. Loose talk. <clears throat> Your perception about the Army's perception, as recorded November 18, 2009, in the dawn, quote, the Army is losing public support due to the military operation and killing of innocent people. This is in the war, which is supposed to be called the War on Terror. You call it the War of Terror. Point taken. We'll get to that in a second. However, just around the time you came out with this statement, the IRI poll was published in which the Park Army had grabbed the top slot for people's sport while the National Assembly came in second. 89% of Pakistanis, and this poll was taken by the IRI, by the International Republican Institute. Uh, 4,900 people across the country were interviewed, 66% from rural areas, 34% from urban areas. After the SWAT operation, 89% in support of the army. Yet Imran Khan is saying the army is losing public support. Once again, an example of Imran Khan and his views not resounding, not reflecting what the country is thinking. Well, documented by poll. For the first, uh, it's, it's important to realize I do not base my opinions on opinion polls. I base my opinion on what I think is the right thing to do for Pakistan. These are temporary phenomena. And there's no doubt that the, what, what was going on in, in, uh, in uh, Swat, there was a great deal of public uh, anger against those, those barbarians, what they were doing. But my point is, overall, I will always speak out against military operations. They are never the solution. If you have this whole anger against Swat, and people back the army action does not mean that the army actions are the solution to Pakistan's problem. And the reason is simple, and I'll give you statistics. We have had army action since 2004. And since 2006, when first time we heard of Taliban in Pakistan, since then, terrorism and extremism Quadruple. has gone up 4% Quadruple. Yep. and doubled since 2007. Agreed. So what is that proving? Are these working? And it's the same trend in Afghanistan. I want to concentrate on just the polling for a second, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to move on to that. How do you feel about the fact, just sticking to this poll and your recent statements about what is now your new war path with Nawaz Sharif about his dual policy? You were just on TV the other night saying that Nawaz has a dual policy. On the one hand, he's got this uh, sort of calm and quiet demeanor regarding the Americans personally, and then his, uh, you call them his ministers, they're not technically his ministers, but his, the, the top brass of the PMLN goes out on TV every night and blasts everybody, including the Americans. So it's sort of like an interesting uh, dichotomy the PMLN is adopting. My question is that this guy was with you guys, the APDN, Right? Left you guys high and dry, went ahead and contested the elections, won Punjab, right? Fortress Punjab, as they call it, and is holding it, is holding the fort down, for whatever reasons. That's a whole other debate. How does that make you feel about the man? No, look, I mean, what is the job of someone who's in politics? Uh, you should be critical of people when they're not doing their duty. In his case, he's the opposition leader. My criticism of Nawaz Sharif is this. 
the country is facing the greatest crisis ever in our history. A common man is facing unprecedented inflation, unemployment, lawlessness, terrorism. Children can't, parents are scared to send their children to school because they don't know what's going to happen. And on top of it, we have complete loss of sovereignty. We have black water roaming around, mercenaries roaming around in this country. You haven't answered and my question about the so, so, so I'm answering the question. So his job, and then massive corruption cases, starting from steel mill onwards. Now, what should he be doing? He should be, he should be coming out in public and condemning the government for all that is going on. What is happening? He is being soft on the government on the ground, saying that he's going to save the system. That's my objection against him. The role of the opposition is not to save the system. When you criticize, when you play your role as an opposition, you strengthen the democratic system. When you speak out against corrupt uh, people and you ask for their accountability, you protect the democratic system. When you, in the case of Nawaz Sharif, his party initiated all the cases against Asif Zardari. All these cases, corruption cases, were initiated in his time. How is he now becoming buddy-buddy with Zardari and Zardari is praying for Nawaz Sharif and him? Why are they protecting each other? All right, all right, hold it right there. We're talking to Imran Khan. You cannot miss the show. Keep it right here at Talk Back. Welcome back to Talk Back. Imran, Talibanization. Buzzword, magic word, curse word, whatever. Debatable. You've said that Talibanization in Pakistan doesn't really exist, right? It's actually an artificial effect of badly constructed policies, right? Policies which have been impinged on us by Washington, etc. Now, one term you've thrown about is that it's Pashtun nationalism, which has kicked in. Agreed? This yep. is you. Yep. Okay. Letter to the editor from London, from a Pakistani based abroad, saying Imran Khan's stance over the Taliban is widely perceived as sympathetic. Reality is that the perception is widening. There's more to the Taliban than just separating the bad guys from the good guys, as Imran has the proclivity to usually say. To give an example, Imran should know that the Taliban banned female education in Afghanistan as rulers, and this was well before 9-11. On the first opportunity, the Taliban reinforced the conviction against female education in parts of Pakistan in 2007. In, in position of this ideology, in that too with brute force and barbarism cannot be countered with argument alone. You have to fight them to establish the writ of the state as was the case in the Swat operation. This guy is saying that it's not just about bad guys versus good guys as Imran Khan likes saying. It's not just about oh them reacting the Pashtun male pride coming out and them ripping out the Klashenkovs and saying all right you took me out you took my village out or my brother out or my sister out I'm going to take you out which is what your argument is he's saying something different he's saying they were still doing this a while ago number one number one question I want to ask them is how do they know that this is an ideological war how do they know that it's the Taliban who want to impose some sort of a philosophy as existed in Afghanistan on Pakistan and not a reaction to military operations there. What is the evidence? The evidence so, so, so far proves that there were no militant Taliban in Pakistan till our army went there in 2004. It's when a combination of this insane and immoral drone attacks combined with Pakistan bombing, Pakistani forces bombing villages, causing what we call we hide under the word collateral damage, which means killing women and children and innocent people. That's the reaction which started in, from 2004. It took two years of this brutality for the local Taliban to come forward. And these local Taliban, in my opinion, the majority, the majority of these people are our own tribal people who have reacted, A, to the Pakistan army going there on the behest of Americans, and B, the hatred against the Americans who in Afghanistan, because they are perceived to be anti-Pashtun and anti-Islam. Fine. You take on the locals, they're going to get ticked off. Agreed. 
right? They're going to come up in revolt. It's but a this part is of what happened. Culture. It's a part of their culture. And, and, but yes, this is what happened. And you have to win hearts and minds locally exactly. to defeat guerrilla warfare. Agreed. Classic, classic terminology. Learned it in Vietnam. Learned it in Cambodia. Learned it in Laos. Learned it, right? In Malaysia. Right, let's the move on. But, the communist rebellion was put down by winning over the people. But here's side. the thing. Here's the thing, right? What about Al-Qaeda? These guys, the Taliban or not, or at least some sections of, of the Taliban or not, are linked with Al-Qaeda. Yes or no? Yeah, but what, what is common sense? Should they not have d separated Al-Qaeda from the Taliban? Should they not have separated the tribal people from Al-Qaeda? You know how complicated the relationship between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban is? Do you know how much entrenched they are? Here's a report, right? Here's a report from the CIA, right? And it says Al-Qaeda has assumed a role as a mediator and coalition builder among various Pakistani militant groups, factions by promoting the unification of entities that have opposed one another or had conflicting ideas about whether to target the Pakistani state. Al-Qaeda is playing power broker, man. But Vajahat, Pentagon's latest statement is that there are only 100 or 80 or 100 Al-Qaeda in this, in this whole region. Yes. Are you trying to tell me there's 80 to 100 people are going to destabilize this whole country? That's, the pro that's what I'm trying to tell you, so, that it doesn't end there. No, it's, but it's but a spiral but down effect. Tell me, if, if, if I was the prime minister at the time, what would I try to do? I would separate the Al-Qaeda from, the, from the, our own tribal people. Surely counter-terrorism is all about isolating the real terrorists. You don't push people towards them is what, what they have done. By military actions, we have ended up pushing our own tribal people there. And remember, the way we are doing it, I give you in writing, this is a never-ending war. Okay. Each year, each year, now what is the evidence? Each year, this strategy has increased terrorism. What guarantee is that today, 2009 has been the bloodiest year? What guarantee is 2010 won't even be bloody? Well, you tell me that. What guarantee is that? Because some things are disturbing, right? Speaking of Al-Qaeda, let's stick to just your, what you just said. You know what they said? Just, this, is, this, is, this report, by the way, it's fresh off the charts. And it's saying, Al-Qaeda denies killing civilians in Pakistan. And it says, this is a Cairo dateline, because the tape got there, Al-Qaeda issued a new English language video Saturday denying it was behind a series of bombings in Pakistan that have killed hundreds of civilians. U.S. born Qaeda operative Adam Gadan, that American they have, working for them, who commonly delivers the organization's messages in English, said, the extremist network was being framed by the bloodshed for the bloodshed by the U.S. and Pakistani intelligence services. Quote, the perpetration of such deplorable acts and the pending of responsibility for them on the Mujahideen only serves enemies of Islam and Muslims. He said that the mercenaries of the ISI, RAW, CIA, or Blackwater are the real culprits behind these senseless and un-Islamic bombings. The ISI and RAW are the Pakistani and Indian intelligence, blah, 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 whatever. Al-Qaeda today is saying the same thing you're saying. Think about it. Al-Qaeda came out of the statement saying the Indians are doing this, the Americans are doing this, Blackwater is doing this. The only way they're different from you is that they're saying the ISI is doing it as well. You haven't gone that far. But these are the people <laughs> in have, your, okay. these are the people you are in agreement <laughs> this, with ideologically, this is right? I'm, funny. Talking, I'm talking about perception. No, no, here. this is not ideological. This is describing the events that are destroying Pakistan right now. Look, what is India saying? The U.S. should not leave Afghanistan. They're backing the Karzai regime from where our own government is accusing them of conducting terrorism in Pakistan. And they want military operations to go on in Pakistan and want us to do more. Now tell me, is India worried about our welfare? India has does, never been does, worried about Does it. India want to protect our army? Hold on. I, I'm just giving you the logic. That what you've just said, I'm throwing back the logic to you. If India is so concerned about Pakistan's army, and if it wants the, uh, to finish terrorism, why is it saying to do more military operations? So I have been for five years, the reason they call me pro-Taliban is because I'm anti-military operation. Okay. I always thought there should have been a political solution, which the Americans finally have realized after eight years of bombardment that military is not the solution. So they are talking to the Taliban. Okay, speak so, of military so, no, operation no, 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 against no, 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 I want to complete one point. So if I am branded as pro-Taliban because I'm anti-military operations, so India should be very pro-Pakistan army for being pro the military operations. Imran, the larger issue is this, Imran. You've said this is Pashtun nationalism kicking in. The guy who led the attack on the GHQ, who was he? God alone knows. No. Was uh, he, how was, do I know? He was, he was because like, no one knows. There's so many players operating here. We don't know who's The guy who was holed up in the end. Who was he? I he don't know. Pashtun. I have no idea. He was from outside Lahore, Imran. 
No. They traced him out. No, no. But he's not a Pashtun. So let me come back to it's that. It's growing. But Mujahid, what I'm trying to tell you is that the majority is Pashtun, tribal Pashtuns who are who are backing this insurgency. There are jihadi elements in it. So he could be a jihadi. Okay. There are foreigners in it. Okay. There are foreign back militants in it. And there are criminals in it. I'm right, going to take a quick break here, Imran. We're talking to Imran Khan of the PTI, a very, very heated debate here. Keep it right here to talk back. Thanks for staying with us. We're talking to Imran Khan on Pakistan's woes and his solution to them. I want to move on to the U.S. Yeah. because U.S. bashing is the other part of your argument. You on TV, just the other night, and you've, you've got this new line going. You say that everything uh, the PPP government, the PPP-led coalition is doing, is under the NOC of the Americans. That's your new thing. It's a new tag word. Yeah, that which is, America, which unless is the blaring, Americans give an NOC, this government will not do it. Which anything. is blaming the People's Party government. Look, let me, let me clear, Vajat. I am not anti any country, either Americans or India. I am against the policies, and I oppose this from day I, one. Nobody's saying, nobody saying you're anti-American. Consistently, I have said that this is a moronic policy. Now, and let's, now let's talk about the policy. Washington Post, three weeks ago, Obama offers strategic partnership to Pakistan. This is the story. They're offering us, in a letter delivered by James Jones, the former general who is now the NSA, the National Security Advisor, he came in, Medzardari, gave a personal letter from Obama saying that he wants to expand military and economic cooperation. He went on to say, we can't succeed without Pakistan. You have to differentiate between public statements and reality. There's nobody who is under any illusions about this. You're not going to win in Afghanistan. And if you don't win in Afghanistan, then Pakistan will automatically be imperiled. That will make Afghanistan look like child's play. The Americans are changing tact. And speaking of doing more, you know who Obama has stressed we should do more against? You say there's 30 groups operating. You agree with the army? Obama has called for closer collaboration against all extremist groups, but pointed out just five. Here they are. Al-Qaeda, the Afghan Taliban, the Haqqani Network, the lashkar e tayyiba the Pakistani Taliban, also known as the TTP. That's it. He just wants to deal with those guys. He's saying, the rest, you figure it out on your own, Pakistanis. And these guys are attacking us. He's not, say, he's not going all out. He's not saying take out the tribal elders I wish, like, like Al-Qaeda and the TTP guys. I wish I was the Pakistani Prime Minister at this stage. And you know what I would have done? I would have said thank you very much for all this uh, money, but please keep it. Thanks, but no thanks. Keep your money. And I would have said that I am no longer going to be part of this insane and immoral war where my army is bombing its own people where there are 400,000 refugees outside Waziristan today, women and children in this bitter cold in these camps, hun hundreds of thousands of... Hold on, hold on. Iran, Bajaz, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just complete what I'm saying. You ask, you're asking me questions, and I'll tell you what I would have done. My country and my people should come first. And how I would have dealt with the insurgents, I would have pulled my army out, I would have started talking to the people in, in all the tribal areas, won them over to my side, and with the Frontier Corps, I would have isolated the real terrorists, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether the jihadi who want to impose some sort of an Islamic system on the, on the point of a gun, I would have taken care of them through my tribal people and through the Frontier Corps. I would have pulled my army out. What do You know why I say this? Why? Because what we are doing right now is a never-ending war. Pakistan is going to sink under What about the and fact? When American, the money Americans are giving us is peanuts. What about it fine, does, fine, it's fine, not fine. going to help we'll, Pakistan? We'll get to the money later. This is this is an ideological argument about military policy, right? Surge first, talk later. That's what people who would argue argue with you would say. Iraq is an example. Iraq was hell versus Pakistan and Afghanistan a couple of years ago. It was blowing up, right? Six thousand casualties average per year since the occupation. How did they stop it? What they do? They did two things. Hear me out. One, a surge. More troops. Bush, for whatever his issues, actually increased the number of troops available. Secondly, and this was very strange for the Americans, they were part of the Sunni awakening. They worked with local tribes, for example, in the Al-Anbar province, which is your strategy. 
work with the local population and separate them, separate them from the real jihadists, from the real terrorists. Thank you so, very much, Wajahat. Right? Is, now, look, that's look, what Pakistanis look, are saying today. That's what the supporters of the surge in Afghanistan so, are saying today, no, that but, fight first but, and defeat them till they're in a position to talk and then talk to them. So what you have said is what I've been saying throughout. Win the people over to your side, you win the war. No, but you're saying don't fight at all. No, no. no. Without any fight. right now. This fighting is madness. They don't understand. First of it's all. It's worked in Iraq. No, no. But Iraq is different to Afghanistan. You know why it's different? Because, because there the were Pashtun. different groups. And secondly, the people were sick of what Al-Qaeda was doing. Al-Qaeda was it, killing civilians. People were, uh, workers, anyone who worked for the government, they started killing them. And so people turned against them. And guess who they used against the Al-Qaeda? They used Sunnis against Al-Qaeda. They armed them. They built an army of 70 or 80,000 people. They armed them and used them. And that's how they curtailed the violence. It wasn't the surge. But in Afghanistan, this is a completely different situation. The Pashtun tribes throughout the history, if you, anyone knows the history, whenever a foreigner comes, they always get together. Right. Now, no, hold on. They're not going to be able to divide them. And what is, why, so why have they not succeeded so far in Afghanistan? Imran, they have tried to talk to them. No, no, Let's but why haven't they succeeded right now? Tell me, it's the, 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 the greatest military machine in the history of mankind. There were 10% of uh, uh, Afghanistan under history, the Taliban. History, Today, 80% is there. History proves that these people have never been conquered. One. Two, hearts and minds. The real battle is lost. Agreed? Yeah. Okay, that's it. But here's, here's, here's my position. My position is, you say, let's talk, let's not fight. Now, I've already presented to you the Iraq argument, where you fight and you talk, and you fight and you talk, and you weaken them and you put them in a position. It's a left and right, it's, 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 it's a boxing match. Hold on one minute. I am a politician. Politicians do not use military means to solve problems. Military in Pakistan's history operations have always exacerbated the situation. East Pakistan, anyway, take anyone. Even Lal Masjid, there were 50 suicide attacks after that moronic operation. All that so, thought. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. Got to take to, a break. I, I want to complete well, just one thing. Where is the political process going while these operations are going on? Where are the politicians today? The politicians have abdicated all their responsibility to the army. Okay. So the operations are going on, but where is the political process? More, more on both the army. I have a follow-up for you for the army as well as a follow-up for you for talking to these guys. You've got to take a short break here. Stay tuned to talk back with Imran Khan. Welcome back to talk back with the chief of the Pakistan Tariq and Saf, Imran Khan. Okay, now, heat a debate going on, back to fighting and talking. What's the American endgame? If the Americans are so evil, now, once again, to clarify, the American policies are so evil, not Americans, right? That's what you say, Americans are fine. If American policies are so bad for Pakistan, what in the world are they doing? They've taken a lot, they've gotten more casualties this year, just so you know, than they ever have in Afghanistan. They're taking a beating there, it's not an easy we time for them as well. We have taken five times more yes, casualties Yes, it's than bad them. for us. Nobody, I'm, I'm talking about the Americans right now, because you're ultimately your finger is pointing to Washington. Right, that's where it's pointing. My, You're saying that we have to get an NOC from the Americans. This government doesn't function without an NOC from the Americans. blaming this government. My thing is this, the it Americans... should be a sovereign government. The, I just read you a Washington Post story where the Americans are giving us more weaponry. They've offered a, us a strategic partnership. They're giving us, yes, we can talk about the, NR, the, the KLB, the Kerry Luger Bill in just a minute, but they're giving us money for enhancing whatever. Sure, it's stringed. Sure, it's issues. We'll get to that in a second. They're still pumping more money in. You cannot... You cannot discount the fact that the Americans are at least trying to deal with the situation. Yes? Listen or is this completely evil, Bajad, evil listen stuff to me. from there? Listen to me. The Americans made a big blunder by invading Afghanistan and not differentiating between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. The Americans you. have blundered in Afghanistan and we are the collateral damage in Pakistan. Tell me, why are we attacking this war? Which Pakistani was involved in 9-11? Where was Al-Qaeda? In Afghanistan, trained by CIA. How did we get into the middle of this? Because a moronic dictator who had no depth of character or understanding to get American approval and dollars, he's got us stuck into something which could destroy Pakistan. A moronic dictator you were initially with in the beginning. And realized he was a moron and that's why I left him. But the point is, uh, Wajad, we are going to sink if we do not change our strategy. 
We are unfortunately led by the most inept gov government, which actually doesn't even know what's going on. Our policy is what we are dictated to by the Americans. We should have a homegrown policy. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, has it occurred to you that the Americans were consulting everyone for two months to form their policy before they decide the surge? Where was Pakistan? We don't talk to did, anyone. Where, did, where was Pakistan? And did Pakistan parliament sit down and think? Yeah, but I mean, which government allows the army to make a policy? It's a civilian government. This is supposed to be democracy. We, in a military dictation, the army makes policies. In democracies, civilian government make policies. Considering the, we have, considering the we country you live in. We have no policy. In, considering the country you live in. Are you surprised that the army is making policy right now regarding the Taliban, etc., etc.? We are destroying our army, which is why our the NM army is going up in ratings. We might go up in ratings, but it's stuck. You know, 500. No, Vajad, listen. To if the no, army no, didn't no, want to fight no, this. No, Vajad, listen. 550 of our soldiers were martyred in Swat, 1,500 injured. Hold on one second. If the army. Think Imran about it. Look at the beating we are taking. That's more than the Americans in Afghanistan. <laughs> The Americans basically only want us to do one thing, to Which keep is? fighting here so that they won't go across to fight there. Okay. So we are supposed to be destroying our country just to save a, a bad policy which the Americans, where they got stuck See, in this Afghanistan. Is a, this is a little convoluted. On the one hand, you're saying that the Americans want us to stop the flow of Taliban there, right? So that they, it's their, their, the impact on them is less, so that they stabilize. Afghanistan. And also, meanwhile, and also, you've also said that no, no, a surge there is going to destabilize Pakistan. Yeah, yes. It, now they're coming no. in and saying that we want to stabilize no, Pakistan. No, no. We will lose Afghanistan if we lose Pakistan. So they've really stabilized Pakistan. Pakistan looks a really stable place right now. Is this because I have? Is this stability? If that is stabilization, the surge, the surge is going to make matters much worse here. It depends what they're doing for surge. There, there are two theories. One, they will use a bit of muscle and occupy the cities and get the ta Taliban on the table and to have a government of consensus, which is, I hope, expecting from Obama, who's intelligent, that would be a sensible move. If they allow the generals to then try and eliminate Taliban as much as they can in the next year and a half, we, and if there's more bloodshed there, you will have people coming over here, then Americans pressurizing us to do more. We could, this, what is happening right now could be multiplied by 100. Okay. We could be in a real mess right now. So therefore, okay. I Pakistan want, I want must part up. have its own domestic policy. What but, is our policy? What will happen if the surge starts and we get more Imran, destabilized? You've just said that Pakistan's... That's fine. You've said that Pakistan needs its own domestic policy. Homemade policy. Made by the parliament. I would, I would even go further. I would say that every stakeholder should be involved in this. You know, this should be prop. This is the future of Pakistan. The army should we be involved in this as well, no, right? No, no, army should not be involved. The army should be, you know, the, the army people, should be involved the people in the stakeholder, no? The people, the, the generals in the army who have inside knowledge should be consulted. But basically, all political forces should be mobilized here. We should have a discussion and come up with a homegrown policy to protect our interests. Americans are protecting their interests. We should protect our own interests. Moving on. You want to mediate right now. Yeah. You've, you've pitched yourself forward. You've come out a few days ago. You've pitched yeah. yourself forward. You've said that if the government gives you an ambit, yeah, gives you a the mandate, government, the government. If, if the government gives you a mandate, to, and if whatever your solution is, if it is approved and ratified by parliament, yeah. then... And is, and is within the 73 constitution. Okay, then you will go ahead and offer to mediate. Now, you've also said... No, 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 no let me correct it. What I've said is that if the government gives me the mandate... I will go and mediate, meet as many groups as I can. The mediation will be within the 1973 constitution and then put it in front of the parliament to ratify. You think these guys care about the 1973 constitution? Well, listen, at least I, we can try. At the most, I'll fail. You've got to understand this. You have only two choices. Either you fight or you start dialogue. If we keep on going, what is the guarantee that next year is not even more bloodier than it, this past year? Can Pakistan sustain this? In frontier, the economy has collapsed. There are hundreds of thousands of interne internally displaced people. If they're all for this, if they're all for this military action, do more, do more, do more. Why is it, please explain to me, that a good component of the KLB, of the Kari Luga bill, is meant to be injected into the travel areas for development? If they're, all, if they're, if they're so evil about this entire uh, Bajad, war. 
Tell me. Why the pumping money? Tell like? me. How much money has been pumped into Afghanistan for de development and why has that not happened? When there's a war Corruption. zone, when there, is, when there is a war zone, who is going to go and do development there? The country is losing far more, far more than Kerry Luger bill we are getting from. Okay, no, I am giving you the government Kerry figures. Luger bill. I'm giving you the government figures. According to this current government, as you know, it's petrified of the Americans because it de depends on the handouts. According to the government, the war has cost us $50 billion. And then we have 120, no, no, hold on. We have 120,000 soldiers fighting someone else's war because we weren't fighting it before. And the cost per, to the Americans, per one Pakistani soldier is 800. And one American soldier in Kabul, Afghanistan, cost them $1 million. Okay, hold, it hold on. So here we are. I've got these stats, Imran, you've, you've said them before. Here it's we are fighting important. someone else's war according to 2001. Between 2001 and 2008, the height of the Musharraf era, the height of the Musharraf U-turn, pro-Bush, anti-Taliban U-turn era. $10.6 billion came to Pakistan. Agreed? I read in the New York Times. Between 01, no, 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 hold, hold on. on, let me do the math. I saw between, that in New York Times. Between I didn't read it. Between 01 I mean, and we weren't told in the assembly. Between 01, I know, I know. Bad things happen. At, well, we're done. We're done with that. We're done with sheriff bashing, right? Yeah. But between 01 and 08, that's seven years. $10.6 dollars and uh, billion dollars in seven years is roughly, uh, I think, I think it's about 1.51 billion dollars. 1.51 billion dollars. The same amount of money, which has come in for the last seven years during the Musharraf time, is now coming in. The same amount. It's nothing. It's nothing different, right? Except that money was going to whoever. Let's not ponder over where it was going. Now this money, the Americans have wisened up or whatever, according to their own perception of life. And this money evidently is going to civilians. Now that money was going wherever, military dictator, you read it in the Times, you didn't hear about it in Parliament, done. Why didn't we see this furor, this anger from Imran Khan, between 01 and 08, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the KLB is the most evil thing which has ever happened. The same, not a dollar more, $1.5 billion were coming in then per year, still coming in. Bajad, I'm surprised you didn't hear anything from Imran Khan because from day one, the moment Musharraf sent his forces into Waziristan, I was the first one in the assembly who said that this is a big blunder and whatever I said has come true. And you know what he called me? A terrorist without a beard for saying that this is madness sending our forces in. Today I'm called pro-Taliban because I oppose the military operations again. That means that the anti-war movement in Britain, which all of them are opposing the operations, are they also pro-Taliban? This is all nonsense. It's to shut people up. Okay. We have allowed people to use our country to destabilize it. Fine. And the long fine, term fine, is a nuclear program. But see, a couple of things. Um, I know you sort of brushed it under the carpet earlier. I just threw it in. Okay, cool. It was a side snipe. You, you're getting better at this, huh? <laughs> so you Go completely on. dodged it. Go on, no, um, I just tell the truth. We've got, yeah. a, we've, got a, we've, got a, we've got a forum thing going on, right? We, um, talk back is very interactive online, and we have a bunch of people who we interact with, and uh, they send us questions. And an uh, 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 interesting question, this came across, that um, uh, Imran Khan has uh, conceived and accomplished many marvels in the shape of uh, Shokat Khanum Cancer Hospital and Namal Knowledge City. Mm. Okay. It is a pity that his party has not been able to put forward a comprehensive education and healthcare plan to the nation in 13 years. Well, uh, we have we brought out two manifestos, one in 97 and one in 2002. All the independent NGOs rated it as one of the best manifestos. And, I'm, and I challenge everyone that the manifesto which we are going to bring out now for the next elections, we've already got the rough draft, it will be the most revolutionary. Um, we are the only party which has done social work before coming into politics. You're asking for midterms, just a segue into that. You're asking for midterm elections, yes? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're, 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 the, you're the leading voice of midterm elections in this country. Yes. And you don't have a manifesto ready. No. no. Midterm elections are not going to happen overnight. They'll be, you know, they'll give us time and we'll produce a manifesto in two weeks because we've got our rough draft. 
we don't want to bring out a manifesto now what's because the, someone will the, copy it. What's the okay? What's but what's the new? What's the what's the USP? What's the new thing about the manifesto? How is this one any different? No, no. This the, because the things in Pakistan have changed completely. Most most importantly, we've got to have economic justice in Pakistan. You've got to change the taxation system. You've got to tax the rich and alleviate the suffering of the poor people who are being told. Okay. Okay. Now. Manifesto, yeah, sticking to the point. I'm going to go back. Didn't ask you this, missed on this, but I'm going to come back. In your manifesto, the one online right now, um, you've. Uh, this spoken is 2002. About, 2002. That's the one, right? Because things the, have changed since then. Under the National Security Clause, right? You've said a couple of things about uh, the army. Now, we've talked about the army. I know we're past that. Just, let's just go back to that. You've said that you want to rationalize the size and structure of our armed forces in view of the strength gained from our deterrence capability. By that, you mean nuclear weapons, right? So you're effectively saying, using an interesting word, rationalize the size and structure of armed forces. Now, that's written in 2002. Where do you stand today? I do believe that Pakistan needs a, a very solid defense. I have never had any doubt ever since I watched the slaughter of Muslims in Bosnia, Chechnya, uh, I think that a Muslim country is not going to get help from anyone. It has to defend itself. So you need a defense. I want the army to stay in its constitutional role. But I do believe that the whole country has to go through an austerity campaign. We have to cut down our, you know, you cannot have uh, a, a huge deficit between your expenses and your revenues. But it sounds so like yeah, all, you know, all over. I understand. But and army, is, army has, takes a huge chunk of our budget. I understand. So but everyone at this point, has the to war cut we're down fighting here. today, the war we're fighting today, today, 2002, you're saying rationalize the size of the army, right? Do you stick by that today? Does the army need more funds today? And you're on the record on this one. Does the army need more funds today, considering the national security paradigm which we find ourselves in, the new national security situation? Or do you stick by this? Do you still want to cut I down on the I definitely army? stick by that. Army does not need more funds. Army needs to get out of someone else's war. And our security forces can take care of this, uh, the, the rest of the real diehard uh, terrorists. Look, we need to cut our expenditures. We have to be a viable state. We have to raise our taxes and cut our expenditure. We can't keep begging and borrowing from other countries. We can't live, live with these deficits. So you have, to, you have to restructure the economy. Okay. And the, you have to make the rich pay taxes. You can't have the poor people the poor get poor and the rich poor. It's, it's unsustainable okay. in the long run. Okay, okay. Last, last couple of questions. Um, this one you dodged earlier, but this is from a forum, so I have to, I have to ask it. A, a fan of yours who uh, was a supporter and admits to be a supporter but is now starting to doubt you, she says that he's made this huge mistake that we, we were sold on his argument about being about believing in Musharraf, and then he came out and said, I made a mistake, never again shall I, shall, shall I support a military dictator. Now she's saying that if he was wrong then about Musharraf, and he came back and apologized, and yeah, sure, apology taken. Most of the country was with you on that, by the way. It wasn't just you, right? She's saying, why should we believe him now? How is he different she, now? How is he on it now? She should realize that the reason why I left Musharraf, because he hoodwinked all of us. He lied to us. He took us up the garden path saying he was removing a sham democracy, bringing in real democracy. He was doing accountability. And in the end... And who's hoodwinking oh, us on, now? Hold, hold on. So he, he, we got fooled by him. He was a great con man. And what happens now, when I, when I uh, moved away from Musharraf, Musharraf still had a lot of support. Today, whatever I said about him has been proven correct. That basically it was Musharraf first, not Pakistan first. And now why they should trust me is because whatever I said about the military operations has turned out right. What uh, stood by the independent justice system. I was the first one talking about corruption and accountability in this country. And why she should trust me is because here is a party that took stand on principles on when we had a fairly good chance this time to contest elections in the last one. We stood by the Constitution and the Chief Justice. We stood by our principles. We did not contest an election in doctrine of necessity. So, so she should stand by us because we are credible. Okay. Finally, a viewer from Lahore says that in Lahore we have a saying that uh, right? That from the inside you are an extremist. Final response. That's the perception Imran Khan has. Pro-Taliban. In closet Taliban. Taliban Khan.
closet fundamentalist. Funny, because when I started, I was called part of a Jewish lobby. I have not changed my thoughts, and from there it's gone 180 degrees to the Taliban. Look, the point is, in Pakistan, unfortunately, people do not understand, and especially I'm talking about the westernized elite, does not understand the real Pakistan. Anyone who talks about religion is, is, is supposed to be a mullah. They do not understand that anyone who opposes military oppression is not pro-Taliban. My ideology is very clear. My two role models, and we, from day one we have said, one is Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah as my political role model, and my ideological role model will always remain the great Iqbal. Now, if anyone knows their philosophy or the ideology, they would realize that they are as far from Taliban as probably, um, you know, North Pole is from the South Pole. Imran Khan. And thanks for talking back. That was Imran Khan, the popular chief of the Pakistan Tariq and Saf, also known as the Movement for Justice. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Talkback. Email us at talkback at dawnnews.tv. Reviews are very important to us. Also interact with us on our Facebook, YouTube and Twitter pages to help us ask the questions you want answered from the opinion and news leaders of this country. That's it from me, Bajaj Saeed Khan and the rest of the Talkback team here from Islamabad Studios. We'll catch you next week. Take care.